Elizabeth. Um, hello, good evening. If y'all want to take take your seats, there's some table space over here. Get some get comfortable. Um, welcome to our district budget town hall. Welcome to those of you that are uh, not from around these parts. We're they, welcome to District Six. There's a lot of people to thank for being here this evening. Um, we're going to thank our city manager for being here. Um, and I, I, I hear tell that we're his favorite district, so that's what I'm saying anyway. <laughs> Good thing he's not listening right now. Um, and, and thank you for, to his staff, all of you, for being here tonight and, um, and for the work that you've, uh, you've done in the last few months with the budget. It's a big, talented team, and some of the leadership is here with us tonight, all kind of rock stars. I saw Maria, Razi. Um, Mario is here, Yoon, he helps with uh, District 6 all the time. San Antonio Food Bank for being a strong community partner and for hosting us tonight. Thank you, Mar Mario Bledo. To the District 6 staff to, for, our dedication, for their dedication to do good and get things done. That's our mantra, to do good and get things done. Just real quick, can you raise your hand if you're a District 6 staffer? I just want everybody to see. Um, and thank you guys to all, for all the work that you do every day for our constituents. Thank you. You're going to hear this many times between now and the time the budget is approved, but this is our largest budget ever, $3.4 billion. I feel like I say that every year, but it's because it is every year since I've been elected anyway, because we're just growing so much. And you guys know um, I, there was a, an article a while back that said 13,000 people moved to San Antonio. I think we were the fastest growing city in the country. And you all know that a lot of people are coming out our way. They're, they're far, coming out far west, and it's, it's great to welcome new neighbors, but that that growth comes with at a price. So we have a lot of things to discuss with our budget, especially because of the growth that we experience out here. The city is also the largest it's ever been and continuing to grow. You're going to hear a lot of information tonight. I advise you to take notes and to ask questions when we open the, the floor for your suggestions. I know you guys are very vocal. I appreciate that. Don't, uh, don't let up tonight. We want to hear from you. And please pay, pay special attention to the projects and services coming to District 6. There's a lot of good news for District 6. Um, real quick, too, I sent out some budget surveys. We've got a really good uh, response rate back. If you didn't get a budget survey and want one, please let us know. We'll get you one. And if you have one at, at home or at your business, please fill it out and let us know. It's really important to me that I hear from you guys what you want to see in, in our neighborhoods, in our district. And with that, we'll get the discussion started. I'll invite um, our city manager, Eric Walsh, up. Thank you, Councilwoman. Okay, so before we start, um, there are a whole slew of um, city departments represented in the back of the room, um, and if you have any, if you have any questions about a particular area or you want to talk about uh, a particular service, we've got the director of libraries. Uh, we've got an assistant director from housing, neighborhood, and services. We've got our public utility staff. We've got our solid waste executive leadership, the parks director, our animal care services director, and some of his staff, our human services director, our metro health director, and our and our um, and uh, and Dr. Wu, our, our medical health our health authority. Um, we've got the chief. We've got Maria Villa Gomez, deputy city manager your safe officers, and so a whole slew of, of folks here tonight to talk about the proposed budget or anything else you want to talk about from the city's perspective. Um, so I'll talk about the proposed budget that I laid out to the council last uh, Thursday. And uh, we are in the midst of doing council work sessions. The council had their first work session today. We've got 10 of them in total. Um, and uh, tonight is the second budget town hall. Last night we were in District 10. Um, we have two public, public hearings, and I'll show you the dates here at the end of the presentation. But, but over the next month, there's going to be a lot of public input um, and council conversation about the details in the budget. The council is scheduled to adopt the budget on September 15th, so a month from yesterday and a whole lot, other, a whole lot of work that needs to, be, needs to happen between now and then. Craig, uh, next slide, please. So... Um, we started our budget process early this year. The council had their goals and objectives work session in April. We typically do that in June, but it, we did it early this year in order to get feedback from the entire council, but also to do the budget town halls that we did at the beginning of summer. And I don't know if any of you were in this room when we did the town halls, um, but we wanted to be a little bit more intentional in terms of asking for input on the front end of the summer. 
Uh, we'll share with you the survey results, but in terms of key things in the proposed budget, um, it's built on the council priorities, and you'll see that here in a second. It mirrors pretty closely uh, what, the count, what, the, what the public um, said was a priority. And we'll show you the actual District 6 results here in a couple of slides. The proposed budget uh, gives money back to residents, primarily in two different ways. One is um, a number of exemptions and changes the council made to our exemption structure in June. And they took that action early in June. Under state law, it has to be done by July 1 in order to be put into the budget. That was one of the benefits of the council talking early in the year. That way they could take action in June. There's also an element uh, regarding the CPS revenue the city's perceived. So I'll talk about that here in a second. Um, important to all of you and important to me and probably a lot of other people in the room, with over 13,000 employees, we are a major employer. And you know we're in direct competition with every other public agency and every private sector. And so making sure that we're recruiting and retaining the employees uh, was a priority of the council, a priority of mine. Um, unlike the private sector, I don't have the luxury of just saying, well, we're just going to do, we're going to consolidate uh, garbage routes, or we're not going to answer 911 calls from 2 to 4 a.m. Um, we don't have that luxury. We have to continue to do that, so making sure that we have our positions filled was a priority. We're making a number of adjustments for our civilian employees to make sure that we are uh, more than competitive against the rest of the community. Um, the fourth area is, and you'll see in the slide presentation, as we launch off into the, the, um, the delivery of the $1.2 billion bond program and the airport expansion and a number of the infrastructure improvements we have in the budget, um, we're gearing up for a lot of capital work uh, over the next five years with the city. Everything from the bond program to uh, renovations and improvements to 17 parks facilities and eight libraries That's out, outside the bond program. And then lastly, and, and more tied to the survey results, really making sure that we're investing in the community in terms of the services that the public and the council said were important. Next slide. So here are the survey results. Um, and that you have the citywide results and the District 6 results. And, and you'll notice right off the bat that there's a lot of common, uh, there's a common theme there between what we saw citywide of the 11,100 responses we received and the actual District 6 responses. The council's priorities when they met in April were those five areas, I'm sorry, they were property tax, police, fire, infrastructure, employee compensation, affordable housing, and, and, um, and uh, Metro Health, public health funding. Um, the public, um, for the first time in probably a long time, ha ranked Parks and Recreation, both citywide and here in District 6, as a top five priority. And we, we, you'll see on the slide here in a little bit, we are investing almost $20 million additional, an additional $20 million into the park system. Next slide. So some of you who have come to these meetings before see that, uh, have seen this slide in the past. This is our total budget, $3.4 billion. Um, it's made up of three main categories, our general fund, which is where we collect sales tax and property tax. It's where we pay for our basic services, such as code and library and police and fire. Our restricted funds, which are our business funds, the solid waste department, which you know funds its operations with the fees it charges, our airport, the hotel occupancy tax fund, um, and all of the grants we get from the federal and state government. And then our capital bro program next year is $641 million. So there's an overview of the total budget. Next slide. Digging a little bit deeper, because the general fund usually has all the focus and attention. It's where we collect, again, our general revenue. And you'll see that 60.7% uh, or a little over $900 million in next year's budget of that $1.5 billion is in public safety, police and fire, uh, one of our core services and something the council or the, the council, well, something that the public certainly expects and the council. Um, and outside, you see where we get our money. Property tax represents 28.8% of our revenue into the general fund. Um, sales tax, 25.7%. And 
and CPS, 26%. So those are our big three revenue sources. Unlike a lot of other cities in this state um, that only have three main revenue sources, we have uh, a third revenue source, CPS, and it makes up a little over a quarter of our revenue. And I'll talk a lot about CPS here in a couple of slides. So what did the council do in June? Well, the priority for the council in April when they met, because when they met, it happened to be right around the same time frame as we were all getting our appraisal notices from the appraisal district. Um, but one of the priorities of the council was to provide some level of property tax relief. And they asked us to come back and provide them a number of alternatives, which we did in May. In June, the council changed our exemption, our homestead exemption, from 0.1% of the va taxable value of your home to 10%. They increased the disabled person's exemption from 12,500 to 85,000, and that hadn't changed in about 20 years. And we uh, and the council increased our over 65 exemption 85 to 85,000. Now we still have things like the senior tax freeze in place, um, and all told, the city in next year's budget is foregoing 90, $95 million in property tax relief. Now, the changes the council took in June increased that $95 million by $22.5 million. So the value of those three things was foregoing an additional $22.5 million in next year's budget uh, in terms of property tax relief. Next slide. The fourth part of the strategy, in addition to the exemptions, was allowing, because state law requires that this property tax rate, um, uh, base value uh, adjustments can't be higher than 3.5%. So we knew that we were going to have to reduce the tax rate. But part of that was making sure that we left, that, that, that the council could have eaten up that capacity with exemptions. But they left that in place to allow the tax rate to go down in accordance with state law because that affected everybody. Uh, commercial, small business, homestead, apartments, uh, disabled, over 65. At the time, based on the values we were working with uh, with the council from the appraisal district in June, we were assuming the tax rate, the tax rate was going to have to go down 1.3 cents. Based on the certified value, it's, it, has, it needs to come down a little bit more, which is good for everybody, at 1.67%. The last time the, the city reduced the property tax rate was in 2016. A lot of what we're carrying in terms of, of new revenue is new improvements in the city. We saw about 1.9% increase in taxable value from new construction, new homes, new commercial properties, new improvements, and that's critical to a growing city. Next slide. So the, the second component, which is um, um, abnormal for us, um, is, is what's happened to our CPS revenue in this fiscal year, 22. Not fiscal year 23, but this year. And, and the council had a long three-hour conversation about this this afternoon. Um, you know, we, we, um, we always bet uh, that we are 2, 3, maybe even 4% over revenue with CPS revenue. And if you look at the history of CPS revenue, it can be erratic. Um, it's not something that, that uh, is necessarily always consistent because of changes in fuel prices that, 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 that CPS has to buy, changes in weather patterns. Um, and, but, but, uh, and when we gave the council the trial budget uh, in um, May, we were assuming we were going to be $35 million over budget primarily driven by natural gas prices that were going up because of other geopolitical issues happening in other parts of the, of the world. Um, and, you know, when we did that uh, in May, mid-May with the council, um, I think what we all experienced during the summer was uh, a, 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 a very hot summer, not a typical San Antonio summer. Um, and so demand was up, gas prices were up, and that, that, that number kept creeping up every week for us. And, um, you know, I, uh, um, I've lived in the same home for 20 years. I, my CPS bill in June and July were the highest they'd ever been. And you can repeat that story across the board. I mean, I think everybody felt that. Um, and and you know, a lot of that was fuel prices that CPS was having to pay. 
that gets passed along to the ratepayers. A lot of it was demand. Um, and so um, what I proposed to the council, and the council is going to have one more work session because we're still working through this issue. But given the fact that as the owner of CPS, San Antonio owns CPS, we collect 14% of their revenue. If CPS was a private company, we'd be, we'd be paying, they'd, we'd be charging a property tax for the use of right of way for every transmission line, every power plant. Um, and when city purchased um, CPS 70 some odd years ago, that was an investment. And it's given us a good solid revenue base. But um, our revenue projections are 21% over what we budgeted this year, which does not happen as long as I've been with the city. It's never happened. The amount of money we received from CPS in June and July this year were the highest amounts we've ever received in the 70 some odd years we've owned CPS. So just like my utility bill to CPS was the highest ever in June and July, the money the city made was the highest it ever received. So understanding that there's a balance that needs to be uh, struck here and recognizing that, at least in my mind, that there was um, extraordinarily high utility bills um, and the city experienced extraordinarily high revenue that was not anticipated, um, I recommended to the council that we credit back to all CPS customers $50 million of the 75. And I'll talk about where the other 25 is in the proposed budget in a second. The idea is that it's based on what you, what energy you used in July. It comes out to about 13.3% of your July bill would get credited on your October bill. Um, this is not going to pay off any outstanding balances. This is not going to pay anybody's full utility bill. This is the city as the owner recognizing the situation that we've all been in and doing our part um, as the owner. Um, and and th there are a number of ideas the council's kicking around and making sure that we, that this is done smartly and um, in, a, in, a, in a targeted way. The reality is is that um, um, uh, the footprint of CPS and CPS customers, we have CPS customers that live outside the city of San Antonio. And, and, and the, the notion that is proposed is that we're going to, we'll credit that based on how we earn the money. Whether you live in Holotus or off of uh, Old Highway 90 or out in unincorporated Bear County, if you paid, you get a credit. And that's the fairest way to do it. It's got to be fair because there is a regulatory requirement here. Um, th this is revenue we collected through a utility. And so, um, you know, if, if, we made, uh, if we made $10 million extra in, in the barge revenue downtown, the council can do whatever they want with it, right? It's, it's open. It's general revenue. But this revenue we receive through a, through a utility and a rate. And so uh, the council is being very thoughtful about that conversation and how we do that. So $72.5 million back to the ratepayers. The, the 5 million of this 50 would go into the CPS REAP fund, which is a low income, you've got to qualify, a low income assistance program that's already established. And so uh, part of the proposal is to increase the funding into that fund to help those that need more help in paying off their utility bill. A lot more conversation that the council will have on this front, very unusual for us. Um, and, and as the council uh, talked uh, last week and this week, something that we obviously need to have a policy in place for. Um, we do not bet that we're going to be 21% over revenue um, on this area every year, and we're not assuming that's going to happen next fiscal year and fiscal year 23. Next slide. So what's included in the proposed budget in terms of public safety? Uh, the proposed budget has the addition of 78 new officers for two primary issues. One. Uh, the chief commission, the School of Criminal Justice at UTSA, a, number, a couple of doctors that have done similar work for other major, Texas, uh, major cities in this country on a violent crime reduction plan. And Councilwoman Havadra is the chairwoman of public safety. She will see this report and the results of this report in October and November timeframe. But in anticipation of that, we submitted a federal grant that will, for 50 officers, requires a, almost a little over three and a half million dollars and a match from the, from the city to add those 50 officers. And those 50 officers will be utilized to implement the strategies that 
this school, that the School of, Pub of Public of Criminal Justice comes up with. Um, a lot of it is um, um, uh, geographically based on where violent crime is occurring. We've asked UTSA not just to look at crime, but look at those quality of life factors like, you know, do we have, uh, do we have a lack of street lighting in this area where we have a bunch of violent crime? Do we have a lot of code compliance issues? What's driving the crime in that area? But one of the things that I think the chief is assuming is gonna happen, and he's likely, he's, he's likely correct, is it's gonna require additional visibility in those areas uh, in order to prevent that crime uh, from occurring. The second area, the city in early 2024 will be opening the North St. Mary's uh, police station. Um, that facility will open up in early 2024. We're adding 28, we're proposing to add 28 police supervisors to outfit that group, or outfit that, uh, that, that new department, or that new building, I'm sorry. And we'll need to hire those folks next summer to have them in place for the opening of that facility. We've got $6.2 million in the budget for the collective bargaining agreement with the Police Officers Association a 3.5% um, uh, wage adjustment for them. And then we'll be replacing our in-car video system, our in-car camera system. You know, all the officers that you see or you encounter all have the body-worn cameras um, on their chest, but we also have cameras in the vehicles, and we need to replace that system. The second area that was a priority in District 6 was infrastructure maintenance. And next year's proposed budget includes uh, almost $154 million in infrastructure maintenance. This is not bond work. This is maintaining our streets, and the, you know, the two biggest categories on this list are streets and new sidewalks. Um, and and um, uh, you see that the investment is $13 million more than we had in this year's budget. We certainly know that our 4,000 plus miles of streets and the, uh, the number of sidewalk gaps we still have in the community is still a need. Um, and so that $21 million in sidewalks is, um, um, is there in the proposed budget. Let me stop there for a second and dial back for a second. Remember I said we were gonna be $75 million over budget in CPS, and I talked about the $50 million. Where's the other 25? The other 25 is in three areas in the proposed budget. Six of it is in that $21 million, because that was a high priority to the council. Um, 10 of it is in the Edwards Aquifer Protection Program, where we have, where we buy property with a recharge in the contributing zone to protect the aquifer. Um, we are scheduled to issue debt next year, and rather than issue debt, we will fund cash, by proposing that we cash fund that $10 million uh, from the, the 75. And the last $9 million would be uh, the construction or the purchase of, of an all hazards um, warehouse. Um, and, and that was a recommendation that came out of the uh, Committee on Emergency Preparedness after the winter storm um, twice in my tenure as city manager um, we have had to rush to buy supplies. Um, I got plenty of space to put it. I got the convention center, I got the Alamo Dome. We got plenty of big buildings to put it. But we don't keep a good supply, any really supply of things like water, um, basic supplies. Uh, we, we obviously have that for police and fire, but for the rest of the city departments, uh, for the general public, and um, and we need to have some place. It's, it's not the, I'm not talking about the, uh, creating the strategic national reserve system with the city of San Antonio, but some type of facility where we can store water that we may need um, um, quickly. Um, and, and so that's where the other $25 million is being proposed. Next slide. These are six, only six of the projects in District 6 from that infrastructure maintenance program. Um, I did not mention that Razi Husseini, our public works director, is right there. If anybody's got questions about the remaining part of that, of that, uh, of the plan for next year in D6, please grab Rozzy and his team. Mario Hewn, right back there. Mario's back there from Public Works as well. Next slide. The third area that was a priority for District 6 was fire. And there's two units that are being added in next year's budget, one of them impacting District 6. 
Um, the first is a first responder unit in new fire station 24 off Austin Highway. It's a new fire station that was constructed under the 2017 bond program. It'll open up here in about two or three months, and we'll be adding a first responder unit into that um, facility to help address um, emergency medical calls. The second unit that's being added into the into the proposed to be added in the police department in the fire department budget is a new ladder company that will be added to fire station 45 off of uh, 151 behind the Rudies uh, in District 6. That ladder company and the 15 firefighters that go with it, we were scheduled to add two years ago and couldn't afford it. We couldn't afford it last year. Um, this will help the fire department's response time going south because fire station 44 there off of Marbach, just south of Marbach, is one of the busiest stations. The latter company, in addition to the, with the engine company at 45, gives the fire department additional equipment and staffing to be able to handle one of the busiest areas in San Antonio. And then, of course, we got the collective bargaining agreement for the firefighters in the contract, in the uh, budget. The next area of priority for District 6 was in Parks and Recreation, and I mentioned this earlier, but we'll be doing almost $8 million worth of work in 17 parks facilities that we weren't able to include within the bond program. We did a significant amount of work last year to prepare for the bond conversation, but we have a whole slew of old facilities that need work. Um, and when we started the bond conversation with the council a year ago, we knew we needed, we knew our number was 1.2 billion. The, the number we started with was 3.3 billion. So obviously we can't do everything, um, but there are a number of facilities in the parks department, community centers, restrooms that need work, that need to be repaired. They're primarily our older facilities, and we're programming that into next year's budget. I mentioned the $10 million in the Edwards Aquifer Protection Program, a million and a half dollars primarily for new acreage that's coming online, two and a half, two and a half miles of new trails that are coming online, and then we'll be opening up a District 4 uh, community, um, parks facility that's a bond program in 2017 and a new facility at Woodlawn uh, Park, that uh, Woodlawn Lake, that uh, that's uh, coming online later on this year. Next slide. So our public health plan, um, which was a priority of the council's, last year the council approved a five-year strategic plan to help to, to invest more in public health. And I'm not talking about COVID, I'm talking about everything else public health related that's tied to a lot of the things that we all saw as a community uh, two years ago. Um, it's things like violence prevention. It's things like access to care. It's things like mental health. Um, and those aspects, and part of the plan over five years was to, we, we had a whole slew of federal and state dollars that, that both, both forms of government were pushing down. But was really, the idea is over five years to improve, to increase our local spending. Um, and, and, and the health director, Claude Jacob, is there in the back of the room. The idea is to continue to do work out in the community. Um, and, and public health is not, you know, the, the Metro Health has two clinics, the STD clinic and the immunization clinic, right? We, we do not do medical care. But what we do do is work closely with UHS, the public hospital system, to make sure folks have access to care or living healthy lives I can tell you that Metro Health is one of the common threads that runs through a lot of our departments. Um, human services and how we deal with clients and the homelessness, the police department, how they deal with mental health calls, our EMS system and the access to care because frankly the fire department many times is, is a part of our communities. That is our community's urgent care clinic calling 911 uh, public works and how we build sidewalks and keep people safe and parks programming. So next year's budget includes uh, continuing a number of those programs with local funding that were that were funded by the federal government uh, over last year. Next slide. Affordable housing, another priority of the council. In next year's budget, we have a total of $136 million for affordable housing. $99 million of that is coming for, from the housing um, the affordable housing bonds that were approved by the voters in May. Uh, the voters approved $150 million um, in that program. And we are moving out, uh, actually this Friday, 
with solicitations for $99 million. It's rehab of multi, uh, multifamily units. It's new multifamily units. It's also new single family. And so the idea is that the city will solicit for responses from both nonprofit, nonprofits and the private sector to partner on housing projects and leverage this money for more, um, the, uh, more of an investment. The council approved a strategic housing implementation plan last fall that is really guiding, that should guide, and it's our 10-year plan that we'll check annually because things change. But the idea is that over 10 years, we need to add over 28,000 affordable housing units to San Antonio. Next year, our target with $136 million is 2,500 units. Um, if you look going forward over the next five years, between the housing bond, what we have in our general fund, and what we have in our CDBG and home fund, our federal funds, we're anticipating spending over $300 million over the next five years. And that does not include what we hope to leverage in terms of uh, the, pro the, the nonprofit sector and the private sector through these solicitations. So um, obviously we are moving quickly on this part of the bond program because time is money here. And the sooner we can get to production, the better that we think we can have an impact on affordable housing here in the community. Next slide. The library system, uh, we'll be doing renovations to eight libraries that were not able to be included in the bond program. Um, much needed. Um, uh, we also have an additional million and a half dollars for our library materials budget. Uh, Romero, the library director, uh, before COVID, uh, established a five-year plan to increase our library materials budget. Um, he did an analysis of how we stack up against other public uh, library systems, and, and we weren't investing enough. And, and that's important, and Romero can say it better than I can, that's important to keep our inventory fresh to make sure that we are um, buying the things that the public want to see in the library system um, and making sure we have the resources to do that. We weren't able, we, we started, we started to make improvements. COVID hit, we held everything. With next year's proposed budget, we're gonna accelerate it and get to the end goal, which will get us to the median of where other large public uh, library systems are at. So we'll have a total of $6.7 million in next year's budget. That's important to make sure that our libraries are fresh. And Ramirez will tell you that, um, that during COVID, the, the library use changed. There was a lot of uh, um, uh, drive-in, drop-off type of traffic, but that traffic is, has returned back to the library system and we need to make sure that we've got fresh material there for the public. Next slide. Our human services budget um, has an additional almost $4 million um, and, and um, I'll talk about the first two, really, because during, pa during the pandemic, um, we, using federal funds, started adding homeless outreach individuals, not only for the city, but we started partnering a little closer with our uh, homeless nonprofits. Um, and, um, and we also established a hotline for the homeless, or those that were within a hair's inch of becoming homeless because of, of a housing issue. And, and it's been successful. Um, we have a tremendous homeless issue in San Antonio. It is, um, you know, we do a point in time count every year. And if you look at that point in time count, uh, it really hadn't changed in terms of total, but uh, every side of town, every district in town sees a lot more encampments and, and we have a lot of work to do. Um, the police department can't arrest them they're not breaking the law. Um, and so making sure that we've got the outreach folks that are establishing a relationship with these individuals, offering services, driving them to services is, is critical and we need to keep that up, in, at least my estimation. So I'm recommending in the proposed budget that we take on, that federal funding ends in September and we take that on and continue that in next year's proposed budget. The second item on there is, um, who's gonna spell me? Just kidding. So um, the second item on there is um, something we use with we use federal funds with to um, lease a small hotel on the northeast side of downtown. Only about 45 or 48 rooms, a low barrier shelter, 
that SAM Ministries is managing for us, complete wraparound services. And it's hugely expensive. The federal funding runs out for that program in September too. And it's hugely expensive. I'm only recommending that we extend that for another six months. Primarily because SAM Ministries, our, our contracting partner, is opening up their own low barrier shelter early next year. And they don't have the capacity to do both. And, and this is probably requires a longer term conversation with the council. It's also one of the reasons why we are accelerating the housing bonds because the need for a low barrier shelter is there in San Antonio, it's here. But um, that means that, that there's gotta be somebody to provide that mental health, that health care, that social service wraparound. And that is hugely expensive. Um, and and um, we're only, I'm only recommending we extend that for six months and we figure out early uh, this fall kind of what the plan is with our partners going on going forward. Again, it's not a very large hotel. It's only 45 or 48 rooms. Next slide. This is our capital budget, the $641 million. You see around the middle, the chart, where we're spending, where we're proposing to spend the money next year in terms of capital dollars and infrastructure improvement. The majority of that is in streets. Um, and um, our affordable housing bond under neighborhoods. Um, the next slide is, is really critical for you and the council. Let me go to the next slide. Part of what we did in the proposed budget, and the council got this last week, and, and actually we have a work session on this tomorrow with the council, is that we took the $1.2 billion bond program and we've developed our spending plan over the next five years. These are all the District 6 projects that were in the bond program and the associated spend and how we're going to spend. A lot of what we spend in the first two years is design and then we get construction heavy in years three, four, and five. Um, part of what the council will do um, in early fall is select all the engineers, landscape architects, and architects for all 183 capital projects. And so that is, that is something that, that the, we do all at once so that we can start the design and architect services on all 183 projects. So that's why you see uh, those lower dollar amounts in 23 and 24 and then escalating um, in, um, in, the, in the remaining years. Next slide. So um, tomorrow we have a budget work session with the council on public works, on parks and rec, our capital budget and our debt management plan, just how we, how we pay uh, for capital management, for capital projects. Um, we meet, the council will be meeting every Tuesday and Wednesday at two o'clock. You can watch it on TVSA or watch it online or come downtown, we have free parking. Um, uh, we've got a schedule that here in the back of the room of what, when departments will be coming before council. Next Tuesday it'll be police, fire and municipal court. Um, so we're going to be doing that between now and September 14th. We're doing, the, this, we're doing the town halls. Tonight is the second one. We're doing them in every district. We've got two public hearings downtown on September 31st, or October, I'm sorry, August 31st and September 8th. And the council is scheduled to make any necessary amendments that they see fit and then adopt the budget on September 15th. Next slide. So uh, you can use that uh, scan code or at the back of the room to give us your comments tonight. Um, we're going to be categorizing or we're going to be collecting all that from each of these meetings and then preparing a report and sharing it with the, uh, with the entire council. So we have a lot of people here from the city, so more than willing to answer any questions you might have. Um, and Councilwoman, I'll turn it back over to you or if you want to just go straight into questions. Questions. Now, um, so we have people listening online. So Laura is going to bring you the mic, so the folks online can hear the question. Go ahead, sir. Uh, yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, just wanted to find out, uh, like for streets, as an example, you have a, a big budget there compared to the others. Uh, how does the city determine which streets? Have they already done an analysis, or are they waiting for community input? to determine which streets need that maintenance or capital improvement? 
So uh, either Rozzy or Mario, why don't you guys answer that question? Because we have a five-year IMP pro infrastructure program that, that identifies those. Yeah, good question. We usually survey, we have a s information on all of the roadway we have. As city manager mentioned, we have 4,200 miles of the roadway. We have survey condition of every roadway. We categorize those A, B, C, and D, and F. A is the almost brand new street, and F is the one we call failed street. We look for those streets in bad shape. We work on those streets first. We have five years program, and we work with the council's office, make sure they know what we are planning to do. Based on budget, we schedule those two projects. In the last few years, in order to make sure those council district doesn't have a good uh, condition of the payment, we put more money on those. Many years ago, we used to divide the money funding by 10 because we have 10 council district. No longer we do that one. Any council district does not have a, a good roadway or has more roadway to maintain, they get more money, and this is the way really we decide on those projects. Yes, sir, thank you. Thank you. Okay, this is for, uh, my question is for, for streets. Uh, last time that we have a meeting, I brought it up to your attention that uh, the uh, old Highway 90, Enrique Barrera Parkway, uh, it's, it's totally unserviceable and don't comply with the uh, ADA qualifications. Uh, here in the west side, they build telephone poles. I mean, they build sidewalks for telephone poles. And they also build the sidewalks to hold the ground that's above the sidewalk. That is not right. So... Uh, I'm bringing it to your attention again, and maybe I can get an answer now and get a solution for it. Yeah, part of old 90 we have already built, and the good news is the other part, we have funding from MPO, federal government, and we have matching fund through this budget process. Shortly after budget pass, we are going to select consulting. Council approving in uh, November of this year, we will come to the community get input on what this roadway should like, and start designing and building shortly after. And, 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 and Razi, and I think his question is specifically about the sidewalk portion. That, we have funding through the federal government and through our local budget to be able to address not only the street portion, but the sidewalk portion. My biggest concern is if you're going to build a sidewalk, why don't you build it right the first time, because I'm not talking just strictly uh, Old Highway 90. I'm talking about the streets uh, east of uh, 34th Street. And, uh, I mean, these are streets and sidewalks that are built uh, for people, pedestrians, to walk and also to use their wheelchairs. Yeah. And if you have them in an angle. Uh, even I, when I'm walking to the store, I, I start walking and then all of a sudden I start going towards the street. And I've seen a lot of that. So why don't we build it right in the first time? You have inspectors that go out and check and uh, also uh, up here on the Highway 90. Uh, the uh, sidewalks are in an angle uh, based on the uh, entrance. Now, uh, my neighbors up there on, on 34th Street, they uh, built a small portion of a sidewalk, which is, was a, probably about uh, oh, 20 or 30 yards. And he had to tear down the entrance and make it flat according to uh, the, uh, the, the level sidewalk. Why can we do that when we get a contractor? When we build the sidewalk during the design and after we build, we have to make sure we get the state to inspection to meet, meet the ADA requirement. 
And good news is for part of this bu budget, we have $21 million for sidewalk. We never had that kind of money for the sidewalk. Sometimes sidewalk get damaged for whatever reason, tree root or build wrong. We also have a funding to address some of those damaged sidewalk. I have a staff here, we can take those address and investigate. If we have to redo those sidewalk, we will do it. Now, the, 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 Raji gave you the good news. The bad news is, is that what you're describing exists in a lot of parts of the city that have uh, either been built 30, 40, 50, 20, 10 years ago, um, and, and it's gonna take a lot of money, a lot more than $21 million. What we can do, though, with the money we have and when we do a street, we redo a street, is make sure that we're not doing uh, numbskull things like making having the pole right in the middle of the sidewalk. But we have a lot of areas of town that you just described, just not over here uh, off of Old Highway 90. And, and, and to be honest with you, it's gonna take a long time to fix those things, um, but, we, but we gotta start somewhere. Within the last year, the last, we're not talking about 15, 20 years ago. This happened last year. Yeah, that, that's why those guys are going to look into it. But I'm talking, but, but we have that issue in a lot of parts of the city. A lot of parts. Yes, yes, ma'am. Oh, wait, wait for the, we got this gentleman. There was somebody up here, right? Just this gentleman raise your here. hands really high so I can see him. And then her. Thank you. Yeah, you spoke, uh, Mr. Walsh, about CPS and the uh, revenues that go to the city. Uh, SAWS has a $32 million payment this year to the city going to the general fund. Can you explain the, the, the back story on that? I know originally it was a bond issue, 1992, but is that still currently the case? So um, SAWS, another municipal agency in the council appoints their board, um, pays the city 4% of their revenue. Um, and that revenue is pretty consistent. Um, and um, they too, if they were a private water purveyor, would be paying property taxes for the use of the right-of-way. We do not have, in this year's budget or next year's budget, any huge spike in revenue like we're seeing right now with CPS. Yeah. So we own it, but still we overpay so we can then pay the city. It sounds like a tax. That's just functionally. We own it, but yet still there's excess revenue that goes to the city. It's so they're collecting it to give it to the city. Right, but, but if they were the private sector, they'd be charging you what, what the property tax is, we'd be charging them. So it kind of works out the same. <laughs> you do that, sir, not me. <laughs> uh, this gentleman and then this, young, this woman right here. Is this briefing online, particularly with the District 6 information, so we can go ahead and share it for all those that were not here tonight and available? Yes, sir, as well as the longer presentation I gave Council last Thursday. And for those who need the website, sanantonio.gov slash budget. My question is public works, probably. Uh, my issue in, has been for a while. I go to different neighborhoods in the area of San Antonio, but yet here where we live on District 6, and I live right here across from the Wolf Stadium. We have public works, right across Parks and Recreation. We have other city entities right in here in that area on Callahan. But when I drive down, going to the school, going towards, going to Las Palmas Shopping uh -huh. Center, going on Castroville by the cemetery, as soon as I get out of my home and I go towards, uh, going like towards the highway on 90, uh -huh. uh, you look to my right and all I see like a dump. Uh, my area is like a dumpster. No, the city doesn't ever go by there to clean. I, I can call, I tell them, can you come out here and check because uh, uh, there is trash. The other day we even have a boat out there, a boat. Uh, and then when I, we went to Las Palmas HEB on the way on the way back, well on the way out, my husband says, "Look, there's a boat." Somebody. Are you talking about from the from the HEB to the to okay, ninety? Okay, yeah. That's you know, stretch. if you know where Wolf Stadium is yep. at, okay. So I'm right here on Herbert, Herbert and Castroville Road, right before you hit Porter's. Okay. Oh, Porter's the place that poultry. Yep. Okay, and that area always looks like a dump. It looks like a dump. And that's what I'm, the, the worst part of it. And then, then when I come home to, from work, 
I'm coming from Lackland Air Force Base, and there's people dumping dogs out the windows. Uh, I've seen them. They get off the truck, and they dump the dog. Right over here at ACS? Uh, yeah, right, right close to it. But what, be quiet because we call and they say, can you come pick up a dog? There's a stray dog. Right, got, right now I have two stray dogs across from my home. They've been there for a couple of years. All my neighbors feed them. I call and I, they says, we can't pick them up. You got to tie them down. But we, right now we don't have any room for them. So we have dogs. We have stray cats. We have everything. And I see them. But I'm driving, I can't take a driver's license, okay? Right. I can't take the driver's license, the plaque, whatever. So there they go, and the poor dogs kept running behind them, behind them. The dog's going, you know, and they just dump it. And, there, and, and this is not, is, doesn't, it hasn't happened once, it hasn't happened twice, several times. And one time I even said, I even saw this young man get out of the car and get in the middle of the high, like on the access road after the dog after the dog because I guess he felt like he's one of those dog lovers. I figured he was one of those because he ran after the dog bef before the, guy, the dog got into the highway. That's mainly, that's mainly why I'm here because I've already called and I think I spoke to my councilwoman and if she's here, she knows who I am. We, one day I went out to the food bank and that's when I mentioned it. I said, my area looks like a dump. Now when you get out of here and if you go down Callahan, and get on the highway, you'll see it. There's trash everywhere. Uh, and that's going like towards the base, mm -hmm. okay? And, and the airplanes go by there. And one time when uh, Air Force One, they said, oh, they were gonna clean because they don't want them to see all this trash. And I said, well, they come out here every time and the trash is all there. S uh, there's wreckers parked underneath that bridge right here uh, on, it, on Acme. It's Acme and Castroville. There's wreckers parked there. There's sometimes there's city personnel there. Why don't they just pick up the trash? There's tires, there's uh, trash bags full of junk, and, and they're there. Yeah. So um, the director of animal care services and of solid waste are behind you. I'll ask both those gentlemen to talk to you, but primarily, especially the boat and the trash along that stretch so that we can respond to that. Up here, Laura. Okay, so I have uh, two questions. One of them is for the police. Um, is any of these funds going for safety officers? Because I know they do make a big difference in the community. Additional safe officers? Yeah. No. No. Those 50 officers are going to be used to, on violent crime issues. Second question is for the homeless part. Mm -hmm. um, or is any of that money going to go to like MedCom or CHCS to fund like behavioral health, like the hospitals? So Mel, do you want to talk about that? We have some money going to CHCS, the Center for Healthcare Services, the Mental Health Authority. Um, none of this money, but we do fund a portion of what they do. That's right. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, none of the new money will go to CHCS, but we do fund an integrated treatment program in Haven for Hope that provides 90 to 180 days of inpatient treatment. Once a client gets out of detox, they go there in order to stabilize. Um, we also fund the Center for Healthcare Services to do a sobering program so that police, instead of taking them to jail and for the emergency room and sitting with them, can drop them off to sober up at this um, location. Is there any way we can find to limit the type of development house flippers can do? I'm from Houston, and when I drive back to Houston, I see on the side of the highway where they used to have the wards and stuff, mm -hmm. they've got like three-story, half-a-million-dollar houses. Mm -hmm. I'd hate to see that happen here. It's happening in some parts of San Antonio right now, and that's something that the council deals with primarily through zoning issues. Um, and has become an issue for some neighborhoods. Um, the city uh, updates our unified development code every five years, and the council will be debating that later on in the fall. Melissa Ramirez from Development Services. Um, Melissa, do you want to talk a little bit about that? A 
as development comes into the city of San Antonio, we have uh, development standards that they have to comply with. The Unified Development Code that Eric mentioned, there's um, trade regulations that they have to comply with, electrical, mechanical. The land use discussion is the one that you were pointing out for zoning. Uh, so we currently have zoning in place today, but if a developer wants to come in and rezone a property, there's a public process for that. It'll help us identify whether it's going to be residential, commercial, or multifamily. That is a difficult conversation because uh, this is a property right state. So we don't have the ability to go in and purchase all the property that's vacant in the city of San Antonio. Do you have any questions for Chief McManus? He's gotten away. He hasn't had to answer any questions yet. Somebody's got to have a question for McManus. Hi. Hi um, I have a quick question about, well, the sidewalks I have a lot of questions about, but I wanted to ask, is there any kind of city guideline or uh, commitment to build, like, walkable streets or sidewalks when we commit to building these projects? Just because I feel like there's a lot of issues frequently about, like, ADA compliance, of course, is a big one, but also making sure that uh, people feel safe when they're walking on uh, these sidewalks, making sure that the bus routes are also like covered and shaded. Um, just so that we encourage more walking, of course, with climate change is a big thing, but just generally for our, our seniors, folks without cars, um, people who are low income, our young folks, making sure that they aren't walking on the street frequently. Yeah. Is there some kind of commitment for yeah. that? Well, there, th it, part of the code that Melissa talked about makes that requirement uh, on the developers to be able to improve, to, to add that infrastructure when they develop new properties. And so that's part of our code that's required. On our side, when it comes to filling in gaps in existing neighborhoods, public works and the council districts and the city prioritize what gaps we're gonna fill in first with that $21 million. It is um, around schools, it is around bus stops, it is around um, hospitals. And so we prioritize those first from a, from a walkability standpoint to help encourage and facilitate that pedestrian traffic. We have time for one more question. Chief McManus wants a question. <laughs> Hello, uh, uh, Eric. Um, I just want to say that I think you and your staff, your leaders, your department heads are doing a great job. It starts with listening with those two years and taking the calls or the emails and answering them back. I, I really do appreciate all your departments. And I love little Homer. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, she had a question for Chief McManus. We gotta, we gotta let her go. She can be the last one. Sorry. Come um, up here, Chief. Just regarding the officer positions, are there gonna be any in the white collar crime department? Because I unfortunately I've had like identity theft and nothing really gets done. I mean, they say they don't have the manpower to investigate these crimes, like people trying to do identity theft and take out credit cards in your name. I got it. Do you have a name of the person who told you they didn't have the staffing? They, sh they shouldn't be saying that. We have, we have adequate staffing there in White Collar. Uh, I will tell you that they're not overworked. Uh, so if you have an issue or trouble getting um, a, a proper response, the, the, the response that you feel is proper, uh, let me give you my phone number. And if anybody else wants to copy this down, please do. It's 207-7360. 207-7360. If I am there, I will take your call. If I'm not there, I will return your call when I get back. Okay? All right. Listen, we really thank you. Please take, take time to leave any additional comments so that we can uh, collect those things and provide them to the councilwoman and the rest of the council. We appreciate uh, the questions tonight. Thank you very much.
Don't you 